Good morning, everyone, and welcome to season 2.5. Uh, do in the in the chat box where you're watching from. And then I thought in honor of today's session as well, we could uh, ask you what your favorite ever, who your favorite ever boss is and why. Um, it would be really great to hear some really positive stories of leadership today. Um, before we get going in earnest today, I just want to take a moment to say, A, thank you all so, so much for being here today. And also B, that if you need people to speak to, then we're around. Um, I can speak from personal experience that this weekend was a fairly rough one. And uh, I know that we're going to be today sort of joined by people who are in a really, really good headspace. And then there's going to be people who feel like a little bit bruised. If you're in the former camp, those folks who are feeling really, really good right now, um, you know, it's kind of our responsibility to bring up those in the latter, in the latter camp, uh, all up, you know, and bring them up and, and help them out. And really, that's what community is about. That's what this community is about. It's about looking after each other. It's about making each other grow. It's about making each other stronger than we'd be here before. So uh, I'd say if you are in that in that camp where you're feeling a little bit bruised, uh, there's a couple of ways that you can interact with our community, which will hopefully help you out. Uh, the first is our Facebook group, uh, which we is freely available. Uh, you just need to find the marketing meetup on Facebook. Uh, there's a bunch of marketers there right there willing to help. Well, the other one, of course, is just to drop a message in the chat box today and, and sort of say, you know, I need some help. And no doubt throughout the course of the session today, there'll be people who will be chatting with you. I'd love to see that chat box on fire throughout the course of this session. With all that said, uh, we're very, very lucky today because we've got two incredible guests to open up season 2.5. I, I, I'm sort of pinching myself that they're here today and I, I feel lucky that both you're here and, and they are here. Uh, the first is the incredible Penny Ferguson. Uh, she's the founder of The Living Leader. Um, Penny's someone I didn't think I'd have the privilege to ever meet. Um, earlier this year, I took part in her program, The Living Leader, and the course leader at the time sort of spoke about Penny as almost this like angelic figure, um, this otherworldly character, uh, someone who had lived the lives of many people, but come out of it at the end, uh, having developed a course that truly transforms the lives of human beings. Um, having been the recipient of all this knowledge, I, I, I sort of put on this pedestal, that, um, but it was only when I actually got the opportunity to speak with Catherine that she was like, yeah, I'll introduce you to Penny. Um, and I'll, I'll confess that on the first call, I, I sort of entered this call and, and was nervous as anything. But actually, today, I, I feel like she's one of my favorite people. So I think we're all really, really blessed for her being here today. Um, the second person uh, is the amazing Catherine Newman. Um, she's the chief marketing officer of Manchester United, which um, for those of you who, who noticed my confession of being a massive Man United fan yesterday, means that season 2.5 couldn't kick off any better. Um, I won't embarrass Catherine here by outlining the reverence I have for her. Um, but one thing I would just like to sort of show and, and sort of say is that in the short time that I've, I've met her, I've been impressed by just someone who's willing to uh, take the time, listen, and, and look to create other leaders, which, you know, Penny will speak about this later, no doubt, but that truly is the mark of a great leader. Uh, I've really, really enjoyed getting to know Catherine just a little bit, and I feel very lucky for her being here today too. Today's session is relevant uh, because if there's ever a time for leadership, then it's probably right now. Um, what a leader is, but what a leader is or does isn't immediately obvious at all times. Um, fortunately, we've got two people who uh, know what to do or have already done it. Uh, in this session, we'll be interviewing them to find out uh, all about leadership and, and how to do it great. Um, as today is an interview, uh, I'll just say that you should be wiggling your mouse right now and uh, getting your questions in via the Q&A feature. There's no presentation element today, so we're going to be asking questions throughout the course of the session. Uh, so it's like one big Q&A. So please do get your questions in right now. Um, finally, before we get going, I just want to take a second to thank the sponsors. Um, again, you know, season 2.5 is no different. Um, 
these people have stood by our side they've supported the community they mean that we can continue doing what we are doing so um you've had the folks listed in the email before um this event you'll have them listed in the email following up this event um so please do take the time to see seek out those people uh, they're linked in the, in the in the email that i sent and uh just say thank you for supporting our community while we're here i want to say a big thank you to uh content cow pitch fiverr redgate cambridge martin college Lido, brand further third light and human just do take a second to say thank you so uh that's my introduction done so penny catherine welcome welcome thank you so much for being here this morning um, hi good morning thank you and let's launch in for the first question so i'm, I'm throwing up a one of definitions here uh so let's start off with penny uh what do you think defines a great leader well i think leadership for me comes down very simply to three things First of all, the, recognize the minute you influence another human being, you're leading. So leadership is not just about being a boss in, in the workplace. It's about as a friend, as a colleague. And for me personally, my most important leadership role is that of a parent. And I think really understanding that's key. And for me, leadership comes down to three things. Um, and they're absolutely linked and interwoven. And that's firstly, how you choose to think. What do you put your attention on? Where do you put your focus? Is it all about looking for what's wrong and how do we sort it? Or are you always focusing on what's going well and that's how you can develop people? So how you choose to think, understanding responsibility and from a profoundly different level. In my experience, until you really begin to get it, most people don't truly understand responsibility. And thirdly, communication. And that is your own communication and the impact of that communication. And those three things absolutely link together. And if I can just add in one of the things that I think is worth recognizing, and I didn't know this early on, is what is the difference between leadership and management? And I think it's useful to have an idea of that. And this is the definition that we work with. And that is outstanding managers drive people to perform at their, the highest level they're capable of. It's very much about control outstanding leaders inspire them to do it for themselves and it's more about freedom so both are good but it's being able to recognize which you need under which circumstances and for me at the moment leadership has never ever been more important that's really interesting and 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 so why is freedom really important right now penny i mean if, if you said that leadership has never been more important why why does that feel more important than ever because I think the challenge is that when you really care about people, the risk is you're apt to slip into management role. And that means, and I did this with my children. I brought them up as a manager. I got it completely wrong. By the time I'd learned, they're all grown up. But <laughs> it's very much about controlling them because you love them and care for them so much. You keep wanting to give advice. Everything's going to be fine. And if you do this and sort this, you're going to keep going. You will retain that job, whatever it happens to be. And you keep doing your best to tell people what to do. What you're doing in many ways is disempowering them. What you need to do is completely shift your communicating style so that you can keep asking people, okay, so if you knew that there's something you can do today that's gonna make your life that much better, that's gonna take you closer towards where you wanna be, what would you choose to do today? So it's just different and I couldn't stop. I love my children so much when they were growing up, I couldn't stop giving them advice. And all the time, the message I was sending is, you're not up to doing this without me. And by the way, you're never going to be better than I was yesterday, because it can only come out of my head. So leadership is how can I get people to think for themselves? That's what gives them the freedom. I love that. Thank you so much. Catherine, you've been up until three o'clock in the morning <laughs> with your child. <laughs> yes, so, apologies. <laughs> <laughs> so like, how does that feel in practice? I mean, like, you've obviously been through the Living Leader course yourself, so you, you've been armed with a lot of this knowledge. But obviously, sometimes it's easier said than done. Uh, in those moments where you're like, you know, it is three o'clock and I'd actually quite like you to go to sleep. Um, is it easy to be a leader for you or, or do you just have to constantly remind yourself to sort of step out of manager mode? 
Um, to be honest, I think at three o'clock in the morning when your child won't sleep, you end up being a servant because you're like, I'll give you literally anything <laughs> so that you will just relax and, and go to sleep. Um, but but I have to say, having uh, done Penny's course, um, I was lucky enough to do it um, physically in person last year when we could all actually leave our houses. And um, and so you do your your first two days and then you come back two weeks later for your third day. And I can honestly say the biggest difference was in my home life. Um, so I have a six year old called Georgia and a three year old called Paloma. And um, the six year old is as sassy as you will and, um, and was not doing very well on her spelling tests, um, kind of had to drag her to the table to do her homework. Um, and uh, between myself and my partner, we just thought we can't continue to do this. He, he was struggling and I was struggling. And, um, and I remember Penny write, uh, reading us a letter from a parent who previously be on a course um, whose son um, had really struggled um, and, uh, you know, w was kind of having the same issues that we were. And, um, and I remember thinking about this concept of responsibility and thinking, you know, um, and I had it when I was a child. Um, I, I remember my physics teacher saying to my parents at parents evening, we don't understand why her homework is like an A or A plus and her working class is like a D. And it was because I was getting so much um, help at home and I wasn't able to translate that into what I was doing in the classroom. And so um, with Georgia, we, we sat down and uh, even at a young age, um, they can understand the concept of responsibility because they take responsibility for their toys. They, they take responsibility for their friendships because they do understand from an early age that they like to play with that person and, and maybe not that person. Um, and, and we started to put some of it into practice. You know, we said to her, look, if you don't want to do your homework when you come through the door, that's fine. But between now and going to bed, you have to make a decision. So what do you want to do? Well, I've decided I don't want to do homework. And I was like, that's fine. But what would you like to tell Mrs. Milner, your headmistress in the morning? You know, should we write her a letter about why you won't do your homework? <laughs> And, and you keep just asking, asking, asking questions that, that the power of the questions I've learned from Penny is huge. Um, and eventually, you know, she was like, well, maybe I'll do it as soon as I come in. You know, if I could have maybe some milk and a biscuit or something, I'll do it as soon as I come in. It's like, OK, well, that's up to you. You, you do that now. And um, genuinely, the, the teachers at the next parents evening said she's very different in class, whereas before we have problems with her trying to focus. Now she'll say to somebody, well, if you don't want to do it now, when do you want to do it? <laughs> it's like <laughs> we have a little penny in, uh, in a primary school because <laughs> she said so much about her. But um, but I'd, actually, I'd like I'd like to go back to your um, your first question about what makes a great leader, because the, the, there's two things which really stand out for me as well. Um, and something I feel really passionate about. For me, the best leaders have always been clearly identifiable about what they believe in. So um, if I think of, you know, some of the great leaders through history and things like that, um, they spent an awful lot of time telling us about what they stand for, about what they believe in, about what they're driven by. Um, and when I think through my pro professional career and now particularly working in sports, um, it's incredibly important to understand what somebody is driven by. And I don't think you should be afraid to show that um, because I think there's a real authenticity about it and people can understand. Um, and I think these people are also very clear about who they are um, and who they're not prepared to be. And I don't know about anybody else, um, but it's taken me quite a while probably to work out who I am as a leader. As a manager, you're very clearly defined. You follow structure, you follow process. Someone tells you you send a report on a Monday, you send a report on a Monday. Someone tells you you have to do a budget or you have to reach a you know, 20% increase in your sales target. That, that's what you do. Nobody takes you to one side and says, well, what kind of leader are you going to be in this organization? Um, and, and so I think that's something that's worth spending time on and thinking about for yourself. Um, and uh, it can be really profound, I think, because also it will enable you to work out if you're in the right culture. It will enable you to work out if, you know, the people in your team um, are either adding to that or, or perhaps challenging that, which can also be equally as exciting. Um, and, and it's just something for me as a personal journey over the past 
probably about 18 months has been really interesting. And I think when you talk about kind of why is leadership so important now is because actually we're in a world where the structures and the processes are not clear because we've never dealt with something like this in, in this um, uh, modern world. And so therefore it comes down to what do you believe? What is your, um, you know, views on risk? What, what are your views on the elderly? Uh, you know, what are your views on family, on, you know, civil liberties, freedoms and things like that? And so I think if you're very clear about who you are and who um, and what values you're driven by, I think that also helps as well. So apologies kind of going back to that, but I, I feel really strongly about that. No, I think that's really important too. And, and I think there's something in that as well, which is, you know, you, you say that you've been through this process over the last 18 months. Um, was there any sort of identifiable steps that you had to go through or was it quite a natural progression? And I'll, I'll ask that first to you, Catherine, but I'd be interested in Penny if there's any sort of, we always try our best to sort of eke out any sort of process or, or, or journey that people could go on, you know, to sort of identify this themselves as well. I think the the first part for me was recognizing that I wasn't happy where I was mm -hmm. and recognizing why. Um, and I remember being in a meeting, um, hands were sweating, mouth was dry. Um, and I thought, my God, I shouldn't feel like this, like this isn't right, um, this isn't sustainable. Um, and then of course, once you have that moment, go home, <laughs> have a bit of a think about that and think, well, this is quite interesting. <laughs> this means some changes are afoot. Um, uh, I thought actually, do I understand um, what would uh, make me happy? And, and I didn't actually, um, I wasn't entirely sure. Um, I, uh, I was at a bit of a crossroads. I thought, do I want to stay as a, as a CMO? Do I want to be a CEO? Um, so I actually did the marketing academy. So I did the fellowship and went on this nine month course. Um, and it's really interesting because you have to stand there and, and literally make a stand. You have to talk for a couple of minutes about who you are and uh, and what you stand for. And they feed you up with carbs and kits ball. You don't see daylight. Um, and, you know, there's soft music on in the background, a roaring fire and all of a sudden everyone gets incredibly emotional and um, and talks about um, who they are. But but it was it was really a series of events um, and really culminating in uh, when I did the Living Leader course. And um, and Penny is one of those leaders that will will tell you exactly how it is, um, which sometimes you do need that dose of. You, you don't need a parent to go there, there, dear, you'll be fine. And my parents are very much you'll work it out. And Penny was like, deep down, you know what you want to do. Get on with it, you know, <laughs> and a bit, but, but in a nice way and kind of ask yourself those important questions. So I I kept on kind of having check ins um and and saying to myself I mean I had at one point um uh, two job offers and I thought to myself actually what is really driving me here what am I really interested in um and and it, it took a couple of sleepless nights but ultimately I knew what I wanted to do um and apologies if you can hear a munchkin outside the door she can also hear mine <laughs> <laughs> well maybe that's a good time to turn to Penny and and, and say you know Penny I mean Catherine's described a, a wonderful process there which was uh, a, a series of events which are, you know sort of culminated in in, in that and, and I think that was a, a really beautifully sort of uh, put across thing which was am I happy you know but is there is there a process that people can go through to determine what kind of leader they they should be or would like to be how could you possibly use the word should? <laughs> Would like to be. <laughs> um, it's, it's kind of, an, it is an interesting question. I'm thinking, what is it? Let me just share a little bit. Um, my last husband was a very good management trainer. Very good. And people used to leave his program saying, amazing, best program I've ever done. But I used to go and meet a lot of the clients six months afterwards. And what I could not get my head around was they'd forgotten 80% of it within three weeks. Mm -hmm. What was actually sticking? What was real behavior change? And it was virtually nothing. And this didn't fit with my values. I wasn't comfortable, but I knew I wanted to make a difference. And the other thing that I became really aware of was when I, I had a year when I was doing all sorts of weird and wonderful things after my um, second son died and my marriage fell apart. And... Any, nothing like anything I'd done before, but one of those things was hypnotherapy. 
and there's another one that I won't bother to explain, but what I couldn't get my, I just couldn't get comfortable with, somebody might come in with, I don't know, um, a phobia about flying, and you had learned to process as a hypnotherapist, you could take them through a process and suddenly they'd go off and become an air hostess. But it was me doing it for them. And that's what I wasn't comfortable with. And I thought, it's not what I want to do. So I almost discovered what I didn't want first. I want to be the catalyst that will help people do it for themselves. And that was where my journey began. And that was why I'd avoided getting involved in any sort of training for about, God, I don't know how long, about 18 months, two years. And I found more and more often that people were going on what you'd call personal development programs, um, nothing to do with work. And I used to ask people, I used to go and try them and say, how do you use this in the workplace? And basically people would say, oh, you can't take this to the workplace. And I began to think, do people see them as two, themselves as two different people? They've got to remember to pick up the work toolkit when they walk in the work door. They've got to pick up the skill set. But you've got to remember to pick the darn thing up. And I thought, this isn't what it's about. How? And the more I looked at it, the more I thought, I want to have the courage to be authentic. I want to have the courage to be who I am in every part. And also, I want to help people do it for themselves. I don't want to be the person who does it for them. And so that was really where the journey began. When I designed my program, I don't think I knew what the hell I was doing. It was sort of take everything I've learned over the years, put it together, manage to persuade six very brave people to come and try it. Mm -hmm. I was come up blown away when somebody was head of all training and development for some microsystems in the UK. So that two days has just changed my life. I haven't got the faintest idea why. <laughs> it's a year to work out why. And so my discovering leadership was almost in a way a little bit like Catherine mm. finding out what I didn't want mm. so for Catherine it was saying I don't want to go on being unhappy I don't want to be in a culture that is really awful what I began to say is these are the things that make me uncomfortable these are the things I don't want mm. and so through that I began to find the journey and I realized when I first launched my program I didn't know what leadership was it took me a year of running the program before I thought I'm beginning to get my head around what leadership is. And once I got my head around it, I can honestly say it is the absolute foundation of my life. Absolute found in every single part of my life. There's no part of my life it doesn't touch. And if you become an outstanding leader, literally you will positively impact every single person whose life you touch. No question. Absolutely. I love that, you know, and, and, we're not just here to speak about the course it, we, we, um, but you know having been through it you know we've got a shared experience so you know I, having been through the course when uh, we spoke about communication styles I remember listening to my wife on, on the phone that night um, in, in a different way to what I'd listened to her before and I remember sort of coming away and thinking that was a great great conversation you know and it's not like I thought we had bad conversations before you know but there was there was something about uh, there was a couple of points you made there there was one about communication style but then also about uh helping you know having a, a truly outward focus you know and, and looking to to elevate the other person and it was really quite amazing so um there's a question here um from Dan um which links into the difference between leadership and, and management. Uh, and folks, you can get your questions in. And if you use the thumbs up feature, I'll try and ask the questions we're at the top. Um, so do make sure to use the thumbs up feature. Uh, so Dan says, uh, how do you recognize, uh, find and recognize the best balance between hands-on training slash coaching of junior team members versus giving them the freedom to work things out for themselves and make mistakes? Um, Catherine, if you want to take that first, if that's okay. Um, so I would say the first thing to do is to provide them with a really safe space um, because, you know, you don't want anything that's going to damage their career <laughs> um, or damage their confidence. 
so so I think um, you know a good blend of practical um, uh, experience is good so on the job so giving them the opportunity um, so there's someone in my team for example who um, uh, was just uh, coming to the end of her probation um, and you know technically she was absolutely fine to pass but from a confidence point of view um, she, she was perhaps lacking in it um, and, and I thought this isn't something that you can tell somebody, you can't say to someone, be funny, be confident, mm -hmm. be brave. Um, you have to give them the opportunity to try and do it. And, and I guess one that is about learning the skill set in which to do it. So, um, you know, if there are courses which can help them, then, then of course do that. But for me, um, I find that by talking to that individual and by asking them, so, for example, with this particular lady, um, she said to me, she said, I've just actually not owned anything here yet. Um, and I said, OK, um, it, do you have something in mind? Um, she didn't. Um, but I had something on my list which I needed to, to get started. And I said, how would you feel if we worked on this together, but you took the lead? So I'm, I'm here if you need me. You can have some check-ins with me, but, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy for you to, to, to crack on and do it. Um, and it's been amazing. She has flourished. I mean, she, she's, a, she's a different person. And, and I wouldn't say it's because, you know, technical skills are improved or, or in fact, she, she's not even done Penny's course yet. Um, although <laughs> we, we will be signing her up. Um, but, um, but it was amazing just giving her that opportunity. But I guess it was, it was two things for me. And, and this is what one particular boss did to me, which I, I can categorically tell, tell you changed my career was that A, they said, um, you may not have confidence in you essentially, but I've got confidence in you and I'm, and I'm prepared to back you. But the other thing is, is that I'm prepared to let you fail if, and that's okay. Like you won't get all of this right um, because we don't know every single step from now till January, for example. Um, and I mean, how could we at the moment? We don't have fans in stadiums and, you know, and it's all rather challenging. Um, but I said, if this is what you want to do and, and you're happy to, to, to work with me on it, um, then, then I'm very happy to support you. And so I, I, that's, that's a particular individual. Um, I think if somebody says, no, I want to have, um, uh, you know, more support, um, more training, then, then I think that's fine. Um, but for me, I think giving somebody the opportunity to, to rise up and, and, to, and to have that, or, you know, to, to be able to develop their confidence and develop the skills themselves. They, they may not get it right um, first off, but the point is they'll try. Um, and, and that's really encouraging to see. And for me as a leader, that's, that's a great day. That is a great day at work. I love that, I absolutely love that. Um, Penny, do you have anything to add there um, on on um, how you bring through junior junior people and identify those moments where you should be taking a, a sort of more hands-on approach, a more managerial approach versus a leadership approach? Okay, first thing is um, I've done quite a bit of, um, given quite a lot of support over these last few months. And one of the things that I find often is that, and it almost doesn't matter what level, but certainly true of the more junior is they don't have real clarity about exactly what they can take responsibility for and what they can't take responsibility for. So the first thing I do is sit down and say, and it may be about a task, it might be about a role, whatever it is, and literally agree with them what is the outcome you're looking for in whatever it is. And not you telling them, but saying, okay, if you knew you could describe exactly what has to happen with this task, what do you think it would be? Where do you think your decision authority is? Make sure there's real clarity at the beginning, because that's an awful lot of what I find they don't have, or they don't own it. They've been told this is what they've got to do, but it's not been said, okay, so if you knew you're responsible for this, what do you think you could, you need to achieve to, to deliver that? And Catherine's right in that sometimes you do get a lot of people who don't have the confidence and to be honest, telling people, of course you can do it, you're good enough, I know that you've got the confidence. They're not gonna hear that if they believe they're not confident enough. So again, give it a question. What you're wanting to do all the time is free their capacity to think afresh. Mm -hmm. Ask the question. So I understand that's how you feel, but if you had 50% more confidence, what might you actually do? What's the first things you might do? 
Okay, and if you had 50% more confidence, what's the next thing you might do? That sounds interesting. And if you knew that there are some risks attached to here, because you've seen something they haven't thought of, what do you think that risk might be? You know, questions like, if I wasn't here, what decision would you make right now? And if you knew there's some really good things in there and things that I'm a bit nervous about, what do you think that might be? Everything is about finding a way to get them to take ownership so that they're thinking afresh and you're telling them that you've got their back, basically. So that's just adding a little something. I love that. There's a there's a, a comment here from Alex who says, I really appreciate Penny's comments on ownership here. Uh, two years ago, I was fortunate to start a in marketing with no experience and had no clue where the boundaries were with clear expectation it builds confidence in what i can own slash make my own just like what catherine said to, with her colleague so it sounds like you're resonating as well <laughs> um so next question obviously we're in the virtual world we're, we're doing this right now and, and and leadership or management uh, become possibly more difficult um, so the question from Roos is, uh, how do you manage to keep your team motivated and connected to each other and the company throughout the quarantine? And Penny, I know you're going to love this because it's, it's hit like one of your like ding, ding, ding moments, hasn't it? So like, uh, yeah. Penny, do you want to go for it? Yeah, it's really interesting because whenever I'm running a program or whenever I'm doing the virtual one, I will invariably ask people and say to them, right, I want all of you to put your hands up and tell me how many of you believe as managers, your role is to motivate your teams. Nine out of 10 hands go up every time. And I say, I don't agree with you guys. That's not your role at all. Your role is to inspire them to motivate themselves. And it requires a different way of behaving. It may sound very subtle, but it's so key. So, if you're sitting there worried, how do I motivate my team? What do I need to do to get them to feel better? Let go of that. Either have a meeting one-on-one -on -one or have a meeting with your team, virtually whatever, and say, okay, guys, it's kind of interesting. Being motivated at this time may not be easy. And if we knew as a team, we can get ourselves even more motivated, what do we think we might do? Ask them, you know, and just say, what is it? What, what might you need to enjoy your room? What might you... What, what's going on for you at home? Okay, so what else could we do? At our next meeting, tell you what, I've had an idea. Or get other people to come up with ideas. And somebody might say, I'll tell you what, let's all get to know each other a little better. Why don't we all bring one thing that's really important to us and tell us what it means for us? You know, ask them, but don't ever feel it's your role to motivate them because A, that's gonna give you untold pressure. You're gonna keep thinking, what else can I do? And it's not what's required, it's getting them to take ownership, ask questions and involve them. I love it. That's my answer. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely love it. I love the, uh, the body language. As soon as the question was answered, you know. Can... <laughs> but Catherine, you, you, you've actually walked into this role uh, forgive me if uh, this isn't correct but more or less in an entirely virtual environment so yes. uh how did you manage that on a, on a sort of very practical basis because that's that's new to us all right yeah it was surreal I mean um, my dad is a city fan and uh, and <laughs> he was like you know you're joining begrudgingly um you know like the, the biggest football club in the world and um, how does it feel and I was like pretty surreal from my front room actually dad because I've not got there um and then uh, and then I remember when uh, lockdown restrictions lifted a little bit we were um uh um having our driveway done and um and a car pulled up and uh, and I could see the builders chatting to somebody and I thought oh you know must be a friend or something like that and I noticed he was carrying a united bag so uh, this is in the school holidays. So I went to the front door and accompanied by Georgia and Paloma, opened the door and a, a gentleman who's been at the club for over 30 years, he came over and he said, hello, Catherine, you know, uh, I hear you're new to the club. And I said, yes, yes, I am. And he said, you can't get to Old Trafford. So we brought Old Trafford to you. And they brought me a personalised shirt. He'd got up at 5.30 in the morning and he'd driven all the way down. 
And I mean, the fact that my builders saw me in a totally different light were like, you're actually semi cool because you work in football. <laughs> um, uh, but I was I was really touched by it. And um, and it's it's just something about the culture, um, I have to say, that uh, to Penny's point, enables people to to inspire themselves to, to kind of be motivated because. I mean that that was amazing, and and it gave me um, a really nice touch point to the club. But you know, I haven't been to Old Trafford since I started, yeah. so um, I've not met my team physically face to face. I work in a management team, of which um, I've met three people. Um, but I have to say, um, because uh, at United, and this is definitely one of the things which really appealed to me, the culture is so strong mm -hmm. that actually you never start a meeting with what are the sales figures. They always start it with, hi, how are you? Mm -hmm. I, I must admit, I've not been used to that. When someone, how should we say, in another company would be like, how was your weekend? What they really meant was, what were the sales figures? Uh, you know, <laughs> what what happened at the call centre? Did we have any legal problems? You know, did we leave the, the presses on time, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and and it's 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 been really nice. Um, but but I, I would just add to what Penny said as well. With, with my team, one of the things I've given them, and and also myself, is a bit of space, um, because right now things are difficult, um, really difficult for for some people. Um, I have someone in my team who's got MS. Uh, my sister's actually got MS, and they've been really struggling um, physically, um, uh, mentally uh, as well. And and I thought this isn't a a question to to say, you know, kind of like how can maybe I make you feel better? I, I think it's actually you need space, you need time, um, you need to know that I'm here. Um, and likewise, sometimes when we have, you know, like a, a weekly check in. Um, it's it's actually nothing to, to do with work, mm. um, which has actually been really nice. And yeah, we'll talk about the game if we've won. Uh, if we've not, then we'll shuffle past. Um, like on Sunday, my other yeah. half being an Arsenal <laughs> fan, it was rather quiet in this house. Um, but um, but I think right now, what I've been concentrating on doing is getting to know the person before getting to know the role. Um, I know what they should be doing, but I'm more interested in who they are. Mm -hmm. um, and that's been really nice. And, and actually, I'll give you an example. There's, um, there's someone in my team who um, is in a pop group, but I had no idea. <laughs> In fact, he's probably not a pop group, to be fair. It's more keen. And uh, and I, I just happened to say to him, not last weekend, but the weekend before, I said, oh, how did you spend your weekend? And he said, oh, I was in the recording studio. And I was like, oh, right, OK. I was like, any good? And, uh, and he said, well, I'm on Spotify and Amazon. So, you know, I suppose we're not bad. And I was like, whoa, 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 but, like, I could buy this. And anyway, he sent it over and... Um, and, and this is just the way um, United is. Um, I passed it through to the editorial team and the editorial team were like, this is amazing. You know, clearly they need a bit of a, a lift up to try and help. We'll, we'll try and use this on some of the videos that we use for the fans um, because it's really awesome. But likewise, do you think you could do something um, around kind of this? I mean, they're called, the, the song was called State of Mind by Pacific. Um, and uh, and they were like, well, what, what about if we gave you something around some of the themes of the fans? You know, could you think about something like that? And it was amazing. And I mean, he was a great guy before, but now we're kind of helping things outside of work as well. It's been really nice. So, so when I do my PDRs, for example, I ask for objectives that are professional, but I also say, what are your personal objectives? Like, if you want to be a better parent, how can I not help you because I'm conscious Penny will be like, hang on a second. <laughs> but it, for example, in my old role, somebody said to me, if I could start work at 10 every day, it would mean that my wife could go back to being a yoga instructor because that's quite early morning, et cetera, et cetera. So, so could we do that? And, and we did. And bless her, she texted me and said, you know, you've made a difference to this family. It, it wasn't actually me at all. It was him asking. Um, and so you know, instead of it being a kind of personal objective, I'm like, there's one plan because you've got one life. Mm. So what are the personal objectives, but what are the objectives that make you a better parent or something? So I know in my interview with United, I said to them, if you expect me to be out of the country, 
on a plane, um, you know, for 90% of my time, I'm going to be really unhappy because I'm not going to see the girls and I'm, I'm not going to see Richard, my other half. Um, so that's not the best way to, to, to get, you know, the best out of me. So I try and understand what it is outside because I think then you understand people's behavior better you understand what they're motivated by better and likewise you never know there may be an opportunity where you can give them a hand with something and again that's pretty special that's quite nice when that happens absolutely I love that so there's a couple of themes that came out for me there that there was one about seeking those opportunities you know the, the, those moments you know to 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 drive down from manchester and, and give someone a welcome you know and whatever it is you know those those extra bits um but then there's also just the the, the humanity element which I, I think is is really lovely so thank you for that um the flip side to this is that you know some people will be operating in slightly quote unquote toxic environments um which is really, really hard. And there is a question here from Dan, uh, who says, how, to, how do you be a good leader in a toxic environment caused by other leaders in a business? Now, uh, we can either do that or uh, we can give you a scenario. What would you prefer? I mind, you choose. Sweet, all right, well, let's, let's, let's go for a scenario and um, I'm gonna read it out, so, so forgive me for sounding a little bit more uh, monotone than even than usual. Uh, so there was uh, one, um, so I have a colleague who is also a manager in my department at the same level as me. She is famously a person that when she comes into the building in a bad mood, everyone else suffers and has a terrible day because she does. Uh, does leadership work horizontally? And is there anything either of you have had to do in a situation like this before? Uh, Penny, do you want to go first? Well, because you're, you've, you've put that last bit on the end, of course, I haven't been in that situation. <laughs> True. But how would you approach it? <laughs> well, the first thing is I keep coming back to responsibility, which is one of the key things of leadership. How you choose to feel is down to you. You don't have to allow that person to upset you. That is your choice. Um, in every moment, recognize what the word responsibility means, ability to respond. Don't give your power away. Don't give it to somebody else to say, that person, it's that person's fault, I'm miserable. No, you're choosing to be miserable. You don't have to react to them. You could look at them and think, isn't it sad they're like that all the time? That's tough life. I'm glad I'm not like that. So you don't have to. But... This is a tricky one, and I've got to be really careful here. If I was, and Catherine will know why I'm saying this, if you are in a sort of culture, in a toxic environment like that, and you choose to stay there, that is your choice. Mm -hmm. That is your choice. And at the end of the day, okay, it's not easy at the moment. I believe, and come back to a lot of what Catherine was saying earlier, if you truly want to be an outstanding leader, the first thing is you need to choose, do you really want to be that sort of a leader? Do you want to be authentic? Do you want to make that choice? This is who I'm gonna be in every part of my life. Then you have to ask yourself the question, is being where I am right now gonna support that? Or if for whatever reason I do need to stay right now, like in this environment, if I'm a manager, I can choose to make it different for the people who report to me. I can choose to make it different. I can choose to be the sort of leader I want to be. What goes on around me, I may need to be the mushroom. I need to be protecting my team. But at the end of the day, you have to take ownership for everything. Circumstances outside of you, you can't, you know, and we can't at the moment for what's outside of us. We can't, you know, you wrote a wonderful thing on LinkedIn. I think it was on Monday. I can't remember yesterday, whenever, very recently anyway. Yeah. <laughs> it's very easy to be taken down by people and what's going on around you. But you can't do anything about that. You have to compensate. You have to say that's without my control. So if I knew there are things that I can do, what is in my control? Now you might choose to say to that person, uh, and it depends, and say, if you knew you can find a couple of good things about today, what might they be? Mm -hmm. Nice. You know, give us, are you are you aware? Are you okay if I give you feedback? Are you aware of the impact that you have on other people because you choose to be miserable all the time? Do you enjoy it? Would you like to make that as a choice? Mm -hmm. You know, it's all about helping people find their choices. 
but I'm sure Catherine will be able to make comments about choosing to stay in a toxic environment. <laughs> Um, well, I mean, first of all, I, I've got a good, a good example where I used to work with somebody who was quite erratic. Um, and, you know, we, we, we were friends for a time. Um, and I remember one night saying to her, you know, <laughs> is this you? Is this like your work you? Do you deliberately intimidate people? Do you think it's part of what being a women leader is, for example? Do you think you need to be the hardest person in the room? Um, and she was like, no, no, no. And it, 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 it seemed to be totally unconscious to her. And I kid you not, she used to send out emails like, you know, I've just started a diet. I'm giving up Coca-Cola for the next two weeks. You know, nobody come to my desk. And I used to think you're nuts. You're absolutely nuts. Like you cannot work in this way. Um, and and also uh, I was bullied mercilessly as a child for God knows how many years. And so I've, I've always had this bit of a thing in me that when I see somebody perhaps acting in a particular way and I know Penny's view of you know could you go up to them and say they're okay part of me just wants to say um what the bloody hell's wrong with you you know you're in a position of responsibility if people could choose to do something else they may not choose to come into work how dare you treat people like this mm. and and I remember tackling her in the canteen I don't know what made me do it that day and I remember her turning around to me and saying, you know, do you want me to hit you right now? And, and, I, and I just turned around to her and I said, well, if you do, then, then that sorts the problem out because you'll be fired. Um, and uh, she contacted me a couple of years later, actually, and was like, look, I'm sorry, I was going through some things. And, and you know, may, maybe she was. Um, but, um, but, but as I, I wasn't, I don't think, really a leader then, I was more of a manager. But I did think this isn't right. And actually the people below didn't know what to say and didn't know how to say it. So I actually ended up going to HR and saying, do you know this behavior is going on? This isn't acceptable. Mm. Um, and they didn't. And eventually she was managed out of the business and she went um, based on performance. I, I, and this is why I think who you are and your values are so important. I, I have been in environments that have not be, been particularly conducive, shall we say, at times. Um, but I'm not one of those people that, have, that has ever been able to stand by and say, do you know what, that's OK, because mm -hmm. it isn't OK. And actually, um, you know, even and, and a leader has got nothing to do with status. It's everything to do with state of mind. It's everything to do with um, taking responsibility um, and perhaps sometimes standing up when, when others won't. And, and I'm not saying that because I did anything other than perhaps somebody else would have done. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's, it's important to call somebody out on behavior. Um, and I think... Um, Likewise, if, for example, you join a new team, I, I also had um, a, a secondment when I was at the Financial Times and I joined a new team and there was a problem. There, there was, you know, uh, some people may call it a problem child, as someone's just said in the comments. Um, and and so I sat them down and I was like, look, we need to um, agree how this is going to work. But let's be clear, if it's not going to work, you can't stay because this behavior is unacceptable. The people in this team deserve a level of respect. Um, you know, you, you cannot um, conduct yourself in the way that you're doing it. And they decided to leave, um, which is just as well, because it wouldn't have worked. I, I think the advice I would give you all, it, I'm sorry, it shouldn't really be advice, but, but certainly in my experience, um, there will be situations where it will be tough and it may take you a little while to get there in terms of the decision that you want to make. But if something's not right, call it out. Because if you're noticing it, there's probably somebody else who's suffering more potentially, um, somebody who doesn't know what to say. Um, likewise, if you're not in a position to do something about it, give somebody else the opportunity to do that. So, so tell somebody. Um, and likewise, if you're in a toxic environment that you really don't like, then please leave. You, you can, you know, there's a saying, the loneliest place I was was by your side. You can be in a team of 50 people and feel totally isolated um, uh, in a culture that isn't right. And unfortunately with something like that is that it doesn't just take one person to create that culture. Culture is not based on one person. If it's a toxic culture, there's many people that subscribe to it or who are passive in enabling it. Mm -hmm. And the best thing you can do for yourself is to decide that you're going to leave 
and I would strongly advocate that. I think it's very hard to change it from, from the bottom up. You can flag it, you can give somebody the opportunity. And I, I remember having a conversation with Penny and I said, oh, I don't know if I'm ready to leave, et cetera, et cetera. And she said, well, give the, give the company the opportunity to almost do the right thing. Mm -hmm. And if they don't, then you know that that's not gonna work for you. And then it's not a question of if, it's just a question of when. Mm -hmm. And that's a very different um, decision to make. Love that. Thank you very much. And um, there's there's a comment that come here, uh, came through here from Barbara. I think it was who just said, "Wow, I think I've had an epiphany." So uh, I think you know you, you're both really helping people out this morning. Um, I had a feeling Dan was coming back with more things. Yeah. Uh, so Dan, Dan did Dan, say Dan about uh, if Dan's still got a challenge and we run out of time, um, you can. I'm very happy for you to give him my email address. I'm quite happy to give him 20 minutes of my time. Absolutely. Uh, he says, I don't, I left last week. Well done, Dan. Oh, well done, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> nice to Power to you. <laughs> Good for you. That's cool. I'm, lo I'm loving this. Yes, Dan. <laughs> Capital X, madam. <laughs> I love it. Um, so there's a question that came in quite early on. So we might have covered a fair bit of it already so far. Um, but I, I think it's worth asking nonetheless. Not least because Sophie's a huge Man United fan. Um, and she's Thank you, Sophie. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, she says that she's a young manager uh, and that holds her back with uh, more senior professionals. Um, they, you know, will often dismiss her uh, for her age. Are there any uh, tips on, on how to uh, overcome this element of things? Um, so I, I guess specifically when you're a, a young professional engaging with more senior professionals. And uh, I don't mind who goes first, Penny, uh, if you've got any thoughts on this, perhaps. Well, it's really difficult. One of the things that uh, it's, it's interesting is some people have beliefs about young people don't know as much or whatever it is. And you cannot actually change somebody else's beliefs just by telling them. So it's yet again, being able to come back to asking questions. So first of all, see if you can find time with the powers that be, if it's a boss or more senior people, and sit down with them and say, I'd really like to know what your expectations are of me. So again, sit down and see if you can get agreement on the outcome. And, they, and then ask them and say, if you knew actually I can deliver a bit more than that by doing this, 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 and this, how would you feel? And then ask them outright, would you give me that opportunity? So sometimes they're not going to notice. So it comes back a lot of the time to some really simple things, agreeing the outcome. And if you think the outcome is not stretching you enough, and there's a lot more you could do, phrase the question in that way. If you knew that I could actually deliver and much more that could give you even more of an outcome, how would you feel about that? Mm. So it's, it's all the time... You know, one of the things that I see is people, when they get really frustrated, um, maybe, I don't know, best example, you've got a boss who doesn't listen to you. And you keep saying, boss, you're not listening to me. People do not, by and large, like being criticised. I did listen to you. And then they quote the last sentence back at you when you want to hit them. <laughs> and they're not really listening. They're listening superficially. And they keep hearing what you're putting your attention on is behavior that you don't want. What you need to do is see if you can find an opportunity where by accident, the boss has listened to you. Mm -hmm. So that's what you leap on. And you say, boss, I just want to thank you. Do you know, when you listen to me, then you've got much higher quality thinking from me. It allowed me the freedom to come up with new ideas. I probably wouldn't have come up with, you know, if you hadn't listened to me, that meant so much to me. And also I felt more valued. Now what you're doing, so the boss thinks, oh, that was nice. I, I, I quite like that. You know, I've got some recognition, got some praise. Now what you're doing is putting your attention on a behavior that you want. Mm -hmm. So if you can begin to do that, it's the best modifier of behavior that I know. It also doesn't, in my experience, come naturally. So you really have to think about it. So if your boss has got the odd behavior you like and a lot you don't like, take your attention away from the behaviors you don't like. Start noticing the behaviors you like and tell them. The likelihood is, guess what? You're gonna get more of them. I love that. Thank you, Penny. 
Um, Catherine, uh, any any for you at all on on that front? I, I guess this could also be also be broadened out to sort of more general imposter syndrome as well. Um, yeah. yeah, definitely. I mean, I God, I've, I've had that undoubtedly. I I worked in an industry for years where my father had been for thirty eight years, and I remember turning up to an MPA meeting, sitting in a chair, and somebody was like, "That's your father's chair," and he sat there for the past twenty years, and I was kind of asked to move, and I was like, oh, "Bloody hell," you know. <laughs> Um, and uh, and likewise, I remember the first time I joined the management team, um, and I was told I'd have to earn my spurs, uh, and um, and I was a bit like, you know, th this is all fe feeling a bit harsh. Um, but I think uh, a couple of things spring to mind. One, understand that um, your line manager is not the only person that you should be influencing. Um, if I think of my career change, which happened, it was because I had become friendly with another manager in another part of the business. Um, someone I was more aligned to, someone I had more value shared with. I liked their direction. I liked the way that they were communicating with their team. And my line manager was fine. Um, uh, and didn't necessarily have a problem with him, um, but she was somebody I really got on well with. And actually, when she had an opening in her team, she approached me, and that's when things changed for me massively. So, so I think don't think the online manager is your only route in out of success. The other thing as well is um, ask lots of questions. So, you know, because as a young manager, they don't expect you to know anything. Well, fine. Um, ask lots of questions, check your understanding. Um, but also that's a way in which you can understand um, where they're coming from and what experience they're basing it on. Um, also where divisions lie. So I remember when I um, joined the first management meeting, um, I learned very quickly that there were certain people that didn't get on which was really interesting. So I thought, well, there's me worrying about being a young manager, but you guys have worked together for five years and you don't even get on. So, you know what, while you're busy doing that, I'm going to be busy just, you know, hanging on in here and, and, and trying to make it work. And then I think the third thing is, um, and aligned to what Penny said, is just find that opportunity. So um, I remember um, when I first joined the management meeting, um, we were under a lot of cost pressures. And so I thought, OK, I could um, take this opportunity um, to um, to say, look, I, I think we you know, should pull our ideas together about we could, how we can do cost measures across the company. Um, I'm not bad at measuring effectiveness, so I'm happy to to do that. It was also something that none of them had any interest in doing whatsoever. So they were quite happy for the junior person to do it. Um, but I made that my sole focus. I made sure that um, I, you know, I over delivered, um, I, I was collaborative, but, but I executed well. And, and it was, it was a good learning curve for me because I had to ask sorts of questions. I, I didn't know every element of the business. So, so I had a lot of work to do, but also I did gain their respect by the hard graft, um, by, um, you know, uh, taking the opportunity to, to give myself a leadership role. If they weren't going to give me, then I was going to volunteer to take one. Now, I'm not saying every time I did that it was a huge success. It definitely wasn't. Um, I'd be retired by now if it was. Um, but but at the same time, um, I remember my leaving due and some of them that were still there and they were like, well done you. You know, we remember when you first started and we were kind of like, we're going to have some fun now with the newest member of the team. She's quite shy. She doesn't really say much. Um, and they were like, you weren't having any of it. You just kept coming back with bloody questions. Um, and so I think, you know, if you haven't got the opportunity, try and create it um, and, and just keep asking the questions. Um, because actually, um, you know, somebody on broadcast mode in a meeting can, can perhaps come across as quite arrogant or quite difficult. If you are the junior member and you keep assessing your understanding and asking good questions, that's hugely powerful. And it also shows importantly that you're listening. And you're listening to the people that have been there before you're listening to their views and opinions um and um and that matters and they'll be more likely to give you space when you say i heard what you said have you thought about this mm, i love that i, I can feel I, i've had a few moments over the course of these webinars where i can feel my shoulders relax you know when when and, and that's a release of you know probably um 
you know a bit of forgiveness you know given by by those examples that you've given there you know as an exercise you don't have to have the answers necessarily you can ask the questions and, and that's that's an amazing thing i feel like we could carry on all for the rest of the time and there are uh, 20 open questions that uh, still haven't been asked but it is half past nine um so we need to give folks the opportunity to enjoy their day and uh, not least to release you as well penny and catherine so um Thank you both so, so much for spending the time this morning. Like, I hope you get in the comments coming through now, there's been a bunch of people just saying thank you for what a brilliant session it's been. So, um, you know, they're really, really grateful and, and, and so am I. Um, if you would like more of this sort of leadership, I mean, like Penny is incredible uh, and you really do need to check out The Living Leader if any of this has re resonated over the course of the session because it's this and then there's so much more. Um, so yeah, check out The Living Leader. We've got our webinar next Tuesday. Uh, please do take the time to thank the sponsors and thank you all so much for being here. Um, that's it for this week. Uh, so Penny, uh, Catherine, thank you so much for being here and, and everyone, thank you for turning up and, and being so engaging as I'm well. Just saying, if anybody's got any further questions, if they want to email me, penny at thelivingleader.com. If there's any big questions, just email me. Lovely. I'll, I will respond. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll include that in the follow-up email as well. Sweet. Thanks, thank everyone. you all so much and uh, have a lovely, lovely day. Yep. Good luck, Sarah, if you're interviewer, see so you've got one today. Go get him. <laughs> <laughs>